Right, morning everybody. Morning. Everybody well? Good. So, I thought this morning we'd look at this subject of sacrifice because it's probably one of the most tricky subjects maybe in the Bible. Why would a loving God in heaven want anything to do with sacrifice, with death, with blood? Why would he have anything to do with that? And... Um, We've had quite a few discussions in my time with different people about sacrifice. And when you stop and think about it, it isn't pleasant, is it? So I thought it might be worth us having a think about it, do you? And working out, well, what really is it all about? I would say if you were picking on uh, themes in the Bible, sacrifice, I don't know if you'd agree with this, would probably make it into the top ten, wouldn't it? If, you ended up, if you've got all the big themes, sacrifice would make it into the top ten. In fact, when I started writing out key themes, it probably makes it into the top five. It, in fact, you might even argue it's in the top three. It really is a massive, massive theme, isn't it, in the Bible? All the way through, from start to finish. How many times do you think in the Bible the word sacrifice is mentioned. Just the word sacrifice. It's not thousands. But it is hundreds. It's over 200 times that the actual word sacrifice is used. But then there's other words for sacrifice that are also used. Um, and if you add those in and all the references, then you are definitely into thousands and thousands of references to sacrifice. Animals being sacrificed. Um, the word ablation is another word. If you add in the word offering, which is often to do with sac- all of those, you're into thousands. So it's obviously a big theme right the way through the Bible. It's probably worth us trying to understand it as best as we can. So, in the Old Testament, there is lots and lots and lots of references, aren't there, to animal sacrifices. And, you know, cutting of animals' throats, burning them once they're dead. Pretty horrible stuff when you stop and think about it. Are there any references, from a God's point of view, to human sacrifice, do you think? That's right. The only incidents in the whole of the Old Testament in relation to human sacrifice was in relation to Abraham and Isaac. When God said, I want you to go and sacrifice your son. That's what he said, wasn't it? But, as we know, God stopped that happening. And he said, I don't want you actually to sacrifice your son. I am going to provide a sacrifice. So really, it was a little symbolic thing that Abraham was playing out. So not a single solitary time in the Old Testament did God ever say, apart from that one instance with Abraham, when God stopped him from doing it, Every other instance was it's the sacrifice of an animal. All right? So right the way through the Old Testament, there is sacrificing of animals, never of human beings, not once. Until then, you get to the New Testament, and now we get the sacrifice of a human being. For the first time ever, we've now got the sacrifice of a human being, and that human being, Jesus. Now we know he was a sacrifice because we're told in Ephesians 5 verse 2, walk in love as Christ has loved us and has given himself for us as an offering and sacrifice to God. So it's a sacrifice to God and somehow God likes the smell of it, which is a bit weird because it's a sweet smelling savour. So you've got all these, I mean, how many animals do you think might have been sacrificed in the Old Testament? Millions. It's probably millions, isn't it? If you added them all up, millions upon millions of animals, birds, were sacrificed. And then, so you've gone 4,000 years of history with all these sacrificing that God has said. The people didn't make up sacrifice, did they? God made up sacrifice. And then you go through 4,000 years and then you get to this point of Jesus dying, the first human to die as a sacrifice from God's point of view. Then, no more animal sacrifices, no more human sacrifices. 
everything stopped there. Do you think there's animal sacrifice happening in the world right now in, in Israel? There isn't. They don't sacrifice anymore. It all, even with the Jews, it stopped. So the question is, why did God allow, or want, not just allow, why did God want all this sacrifice throughout time with animals dying, and then he even wanted his own son to be a sacrifice? Because it was God who provided his son as a sacrifice. I mean, this is crazy, isn't it? Why didn't God just think, if God's a God of love, why all this death? So I think that's a good question, and I think a lot of people get to that point and say, well, I don't want anything to do with a, a God that's got anything to do with this type of stuff. It's a fair point, isn't it? Fair point. So we're going to answer it as best as we can, all right? So where do you think we need to go if we want to start working out what sacrifice is? Where, where's the start of our journey going to be, do you think? Genesis. Genesis. Yeah. So we always have to go back to Genesis for most subjects because that tends to give us the building blocks from which key themes then develop throughout the Bible. So if you leapt straight into the sacrifice of Jesus way, way, way down the line, you probably find it quite difficult to really understand all of this. So here we are. This is the Garden of Eden. I don't know if it looked like that, but it looked a nice picture. There's Adam and Eve, all these nice animals. Uh, very, very pleasant. Now, of course, God said to Adam and Eve, what, what, what was it that they couldn't do? Well, they could eat, but what couldn't they actually do? They could eat of the tree of life. What couldn't they do? Eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's the one tree that they couldn't eat from. I actually think that was a fig tree, by the way. That's another subject. But anyway, so they are uh, allowed to eat from all the trees in the garden, apart from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And what did God say to them? If you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what was, what was the deal? You will surely die. So... In Genesis 2, verse 16, that's exactly what we read. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you can freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Which sounds a bit like what? What does that sound like to you? God saying... It says what? Well, it's a threat. What does it sound like? Does, does it sound to you like the second that you eat it... You're going to die straight away. It sounds like pretty much it's poison. Yeah, it's always like you eat of it, that's the end of you, doesn't it? But was it the end of them instantly? No. How long did Adam live? Yeah, I think it was 950 years. Or well, it might be 930, I get them mixed up. It's either 930 or 950. It was a long, that's a millennium. He lived nearly a thousand years. So he didn't die the instant that he ate the fruit. And when you look at the original uh, words that go behind our translation, so if you go back to the Hebrew, and this is taken from Jung's literal translation, so Jung's literal translation tries to just say it exactly as it is in Hebrew, instead of us trying to put it in our language. The bit where it says, The day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die, he translates it as, in the day you eat of it, dying, you will die. Does that sound a bit different? Mm -hmm. What does that sound like? Dying, you will die. It's a longer process. Yeah, it's a process, it. isn't it? Yeah. And if you think about it, the reason that we die is down to pretty much one simple thing. There comes a point in our lives when our cells do not replicate... Uh, properly anymore. So basically the cell is constantly, all your cells in your body uh, are replicating themselves. And it's an amazing sort of function where the cell is replicating, replicating, replicating. But there comes a point in our lives when the cells don't replicate quite as well as they did before. So my, which was once black hair all over, when it starts replicating, suddenly it, it, there's a there's, it hasn't replicated exactly anymore, so that hair now starts growing grey 
or in Phil's case, just drops that all. He just gives up. <laughs> I'm not even replicating. <laughs> I'm just going to go, right? So our cells are repli- so can't, so basically the reason that our faces suddenly got covered in wrinkles is because the skin is not replicating as it once did, and there's nothing you can do about it. It's almost like it's just gradually decaying. And what happened with Adam Adam and Eve was their cells were perfectly replicating up until that point and would have carried on doing so, wouldn't they, if they didn't sin. The second they started sinning, God did something that allowed the cells to stop replicating. And it it wasn't an instant I'm dead. It was a gradual decline, wasn't it? And so our bodies stop functioning as well over time, don't they? Because it's just something isn't replicating as well as it should and bits and pieces go wrong, and sometimes bits and pieces fall off. And ultimately, the, eventually the body breaks down entirely, doesn't it? And that is the end. That is the process. But what was it that started the process of decay and death? Which was sin, disobeying God. So there's the original message. And of course it goes right the way through the Bible... Romans 6, verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death. It's the same message, isn't it? Exactly the same message. If you sin, you're going to die. You know, that... How many people really understand that in the world, that sin kills? Because it does, doesn't it? Sin is the number one killer on planet Earth. That's it. Now, to start with, we might say, well, I don't like the God that made the original rule, right? But this is one thing we have got to overcome, because it's God's world that he created, and they're God's rules. And this is the first rule that we have to accept, that God has said that if you sin, you will actually die. Why do you think God made that rule? Why is that actually quite a fair rule? What if he said, if you sin, you won't die? Because he could have said that. It doesn't matter if you sin. Then nothing that he said afterwards when it came to the fellowship was sin. That's a very good point. God is pure. There is no sin. And then he's created these people that he wants to follow him, but, but don't follow him. But it's a very harsh consequence saying, death. we don't say to our children, if you disobey me, I'm going, you know, you're going to die. We might tell them off. God's consequence is very, very severe, isn't it? He is causing people to die. I'm just trying to say, if he had let people continue to live, because he could have had other consequences, couldn't he? We've got lots of consequences, go to jail. He says the ultimate consequence is death. Why do you think he put the ultimate consequence in? What would, imagine if the world had continued from the time of Adam and Eve yeah. with no death. There wouldn't be any room for anybody. Well, one, there wouldn't be room for anybody. <laughs> but it would be, you imagine if, you know, people like Hitler and all the, there was no concept, you just keep living, 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 the world would be in a terrifying state. The fact that we've only got 70 or 80 years that we have now actually keeps sin restrained quite a bit in the world, doesn't it? To some extent, if you just if, you, if there were no consequences like that, you'd just keep going. The world would have actually declined. God needed to put a severe consequence in, um, not least of which to stop and make us all think. But they're God's. It's God's world. It's God's rules. It isn't our rules. So I think that's the first thing to say. Now, what was Adam and Eve's? Reaction when they first ate of the fruit. Do you remember what they did? They realised they, they, they were naked. It's almost a bit like, you know, like a little child will run around with nothing on. They don't care. I'm running around, everything's fine. There comes a point in their life where they think, I'm not running around naked anymore, this is a problem. I'm going to cover myself up. And that happened very, very fast with, with, with Adam and Eve. Instantaneously, something flicked in their mind. We've got a problem. We're naked. We are the only, only animal on planet Earth that wears covering. The only one. No other animal does. No monkey, no nothing. Every single solitary creature walks around 
exactly as they were when they were born, apart from mankind. In fact, it's illegal to walk around. It's illegal in every country on planet Earth to walk around. There might be some Aborigines somewhere where nobody... Uh, but the rules of every single country on planet Earth says a human being has to be covered. It's something that goes against every grain of us to think, yeah, we can just walk around with nothing on. We know there's some people who do nowadays, you know, these mountain walkers. That do, I'm free and I can walk around with nothing. But they get arrested. They get arrested. You don't arrest a monkey. Why are you not fully clothed, Mr. Monkey? Then we don't... You know, all other animals. It's interesting, isn't it? Our absolute instinct is to cover ourselves. So, what did Adam and Eve do then to cover themselves? They sowed fig leaves. To start with, they grabbed the nearest... They didn't look round for a nice shaped leaf. Think, Let's find a nice leaf. Let's walk around. <laughs> this fig tree looks an interesting shape. Let's use that. They didn't. They grabbed the first leaf that they could find, which is why I honestly think the, it was the fig tree that was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They just grabbed the leaf that was right next to them the instant that they ate of it. But I might be wrong on that. It's another story. But either way, they clothe themselves in fig leaves. Now, God wasn't actually too impressed with the fig leaves, was he? Um, and by the way, we've got, got on the screen here his, his ultimate sanction to Adam, which we've already read. In the sweat of your face, you'll eat bread uh, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. So God then pronounces when they've eaten of the fruit that they're going to eventually die. But the point is, at that point, that they, they made themselves fig leaves. And if you have a look at Genesis chapter 3, where does it say that God was going to get rid of the fig leaves and give them something else? Where does it say that? Exactly. Chapter 3, verse 21 and to Adam also and to his wife did God make them or provide them coats of skins and he clothed them. Now there's a couple of ways that God could have provided these skins. He could have just miraculously uh, just made some nice garments of skins appear on the ground. Or it might have been a lot more like, I think, with Abraham and Isaac that we've already talked about. Because God said, I will provide the sacrifice, but what did God actually provide? He actually provided the goat, or, yeah, it was a goat, wasn't it? A ram caught in the thickets. So when it says God will provide something, doesn't necessarily mean that God provided the full sacrifice burning in front of them. He says, I'll provide it, but he actually didn't provide the sacrifice. He provided the ram so that they could do the sacrifice. And I think that's the sense of here. So when it says God... Uh, made them coats or provided them coats. It wasn't that God magically just made some nice woolly coats appear on the ground. He gave them the very things, i.e. the creatures, to make the coats. He provided them and therefore God clothed them. Now, that would mean what? If they were having to create or make some coats out of some animal, let's call it a sheep, it had to die. Now, this would have been a very, very powerful lesson, wouldn't it, for Adam and Eve? If God had just magicked some coats on the ground, would they, would they have learned anything from that, apart from that it will keep me warmer than a fig leaf? But if they'd have actually had to kill an animal to then clothe them, now what are they thinking then? Let's have a look at this little video. I found this on YouTube, which is quite interesting. After Adam and Eve partook of the forbidden fruit, they made aprons of fig leaves to hide their nakedness and hid from the Lord because of the shame they felt for disobeying him. Of course, the Lord knows all things, so when he called to them asking why they hid, he already knew the answer. The Lord was simply allowing them to acknowledge their mistakes, helping them to begin the process of repentance. Because of their transgression, Adam and Eve could no longer dwell in the presence of God. Adam and Eve had attempted to cover themselves with fig leaves because of their shame, but the Lord had a better way. 
Thus, before sending his children out into the lone and dreary world, the Lord first made coats of skins and clothed them, giving them comfort, warmth, and helping to cover the shame they felt. Though we don't know for sure what the coats of skins are, it would only make sense that this was the skins of the first animal that had been killed in the Garden of Eden. Perhaps even here is where Adam and Eve first learned how to offer sacrifices prior to being expelled from the garden. If these skins were from the first animal to die in the garden, it must have been a powerful reminder to Adam and Eve of the consequences of sin. It also would be a constant reminder to them, as they went throughout their lives, of the Father's love for them. Now you think of it from Adam and Eve's point of view, right? What do you think they were expecting to happen when God caught them out? And they thought, I, I'm absolutely convinced, they thought, that's it, game's up. You found us, we were hid, hidden in the garden. We remember what you said, that we're going to die. They had no idea that potentially they could keep living. I'm certain of that. They thought they were going to die. Now imagine that, and I think this is true, that they themselves had to, they were shown by God, they were provided this lamb, they had to kill this lamb. What's their brain saying to them, do you think? Here's this, suddenly this dead that, animal. That should, have been us. that should be us. That's exactly what God wanted them to think. He wanted them to realise that they were the ones. But instead, this innocent little creature that had done nothing wrong, couldn't think right or wrong, because it's creatures don't think right or wrong, but this little innocent thing has died instead. And therefore, as, it, as I think it showed quite well, you can imagine their mindset is, oh my goodness, we have caused this, this creature to die. should be us dying, and yet we are still alive. And in God's grace and mercy, is allowing us to live a bit longer. You can, you can imagine their mindset on that. If they were just clothes that had just appeared, they would have just put them on and wandered off. There would have been no lesson. Now, I think there's a big clue that there was absolutely sacrifice involved in that very first clothing of them. Because, and the reason that I got uh, Mike to continue to read, is that we're in Genesis chapter 3, aren't we, in verse 21... And, and, and we keep reading a few verses and then banished from the garden. And the next thing we find out in just a few verses time is that Adam and Eve have a, a child called Cain. And then they have another child called Abel. And we find out that Abel was a keeper of sheep. Now why is it quite interesting that Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain was a tiller of the ground? What did they not do at this point in time? What did they not do up until the flood in relation to animals? They didn't eat them. So here we've got uh, Abel keeping a flock of sheep. And you ask yourself, well, why is he keeping a flock of sheep? Because he's not going to eat them. He might be using, you know, shaving them and uh, shearing them, not shaving them, shearing them for... Uh, you know, for wool or whatever, but it's quite interesting that he's keeping these uh, flocks. And in verse 3, it says, In the process of time it came to pass that Cain bought an, uh, of the fruit of the ground an offering to the Lord, and Abel bought of the firstlings of his flock of the fat thereof, and God had got a respect unto Abel and his offering. And you might say, well, maybe Abel just turned up and said, here's my offering, Here, here's, here's some sheep. But did you notice an interesting word that it said there to do with the, to do fat with the fat portions? So Abel, in verse 4, it says, bought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. Now, where is the fat? Inside. Inside. So basically, what we're being told here is that Abel wasn't just bringing along some live, nice sheep and saying, there's some nice sheep and I'll put them in a pen and you can have them, you know, running around God. He actually sacrificed this little creature. And do you know how I know for definite he sacrificed them to God? Well, because it tells us in Hebrews. So here's Genesis 4 that we've just read. Abel was a keeper of sheep, Cain was a tiller of the ground, in the process of time it came to pass, Cain bought of the fruit of the ground an offering to God, 
Well, you, you don't sacrifice a vegetable. You must have just left them lying around. Abel bought the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord did have respect unto Abel and to his offering. And in Hebrews 11, verse 4, it says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice, sacrifice than Cain. It was sacrifice that... Now, how, what was, how did Abel know to sacrifice? Where did that come from? from it can only have come from his parents. Yeah. And when would they have known about sacrifice? It can only surely have been the couple of verses before when we read about clothing being prepared for them. So Adam and Eve would have learned about sacrifice and passed it on to their children. And they would have said, God requires sacrifice. And he requires the death of an animal. And this chap here, Cain, thought, well, no, I'm not going to do that. I don't like killing things. I'm not going to shed any blood. I'm not going to do that. I, I'm into vegetables. He can have my vegetables. God, and what did God think to that? Not a lot. Not a lot. It says in chapter 4, verse 6, uh, verse 5, and to Cain and to his offering, God had not respect. And what was Cain's reaction? He was angry with God for not accepting what I want to give to you. Now, none of this explains why really God wants the death of something, really. But it gets us in the mindset that there was death. That death was required. So we're now going to have a think about why... Sacrifice. I'm going to try and explain this, and, and hopefully you've got an idea already, but I'm going to try and explain why it was that God required Adam and Eve, and onwards, wanted sacrifice. Essentially, it's nothing more or less than a symbolic lesson. The death of an animal, actually, or even Jesus, for that matter... The death of something in itself is no good. It's the symbology that goes alongside it that's the critical thing from God's point of view. The death of an animal actually isn't doing anybody any good. But if it's symbolically doing something, and if it's making us think something, then it is doing some good. Are you with me on this? So sacrifice was nothing more or less than a symbolic lesson to the person involved in the sacrifice. So if we think to ourselves, okay, we sin, and we recognise that we die because we sin. We're happy with this logic because we picked this up from Genesis. An animal then dies as a sacrifice. So I'm going back into the Old Testament. So an animal now dies as a sacrifice. We recognize that it should be us. Do you think that was the mindset of Adam and Eve? What do you think they might then have thought moving forward, knowing that this little creature has died and that, oh, that should be me? What, what do you think they might have thought then? They're held responsible. That they're responsible? That their sin has been cleansed. They might think that their sin has been cleansed, or they might actually think... Yeah, yeah. so basically, <coughs> I think what they would think is... This isn't, this isn't great that something's died. I'm going to try a bit harder to not fail God in the future. Do you think they would think that? Because then if you sin, you're then responsible for an animal dying. Don't right. You? So when I sin, I'm now responsible for an animal dying. So it's a recognition it should be us. So it's a very poignant, it's probably the most powerful lesson God could have given that a life is taken away because of our own sin. You don't get more you know, powerful a lesson than that, do you? It makes us realise how bad sin is. It's, one of our hymns uh, says, Is sin so dark that God cannot forgive, save through thy sacrifice and our belief? That's what it says in one of our hymns. And it, isn't that true? It makes you realise how bad our sin is. <clears throat> what it should do is make us humble ourselves, shouldn't it? And repent and say that we're sorry and try harder to please God. And that is why God asks for sacrifice. To stop us in our tracks, to make us think. I want to just say, tell you something else. And this is where it gets very, in, well in my mind, it takes it to another level. 
It says in Hebrews 9, verse 22, that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So it wasn't like this animal just dropped down dead. There had to be the shedding of blood. And there's something utterly repulsive about the shedding of blood, isn't there? It's almost like our brains can't, you know, I know horror films will have blood, in them, but it's, it's horrible, isn't it? it? There's something about blood that's repulsive to us to see it. It makes you repulsive. But God says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Now look at this verse here in Genesis 9. It says, you shall not eat of the flesh with its life, that is, its blood. You shall not eat of the flesh with its life, that is, its blood. In other words, the blood equals the life. Do you see that? So God says, I don't want you to eat the, the blood. Of, of, you can eat the flesh, but you can't eat flesh that's got blood in it, because the blood is the life. We're told here that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Why does God want blood to be shed? And I'm going to show you exactly why God wants blood to be shed. It's all symbolic, but this is quite amazing. So again, we go back to Genesis... Who do you think that is lying on the ground? There's Adam lying on the ground. God formed man of the dust of the ground. So there is Adam lying on the ground. And at the point that he's lying on the ground, he's just flesh, isn't he? Is he alive at that point? No. He's just flesh. He's just a body. All happy with that? Now, God does something then. What does he do? He breathed into his nostrils. Interesting. Why do you think it says God... This is God's power, isn't it, that's going into him. But God says, I'm putting my power in through your nose. I'm putting it in through your nostrils. It's interesting that he says that, isn't it? And he breathed into him. It's almost like God's giving in. It can't just be normal oxygen, can it? Because otherwise you could get a dead person, pump some oxygen and he's alive again. This is something more than just oxygen that God put into him, don't you think? But he put it in through his nose. He put it in through his nose. So this Adam now has got the power of God coming in through his nose. But what do we put in through our nose? Oxygen. Oxygen. Here we've got body, flesh and man, right? And here we've got air and oxygen and God. Now we know originally it was more than just oxygen, but you see what God's trying to say. Now is it oxygen that keeps our flesh alive right now? As we breathe in, do you think that's doing anything? Yeah. Yeah. It is. Now, the question is, how does oxygen get into our flesh? Through By the blood. The oxygen gets into our body and flesh via the blood and only through our blood. The blood is grabbing in uh, oxygen... And carrying it to every single solitary part of your body apart from one part. There's just one part that, where, where it doesn't, and that is the cornea and your eye. But that's another story as to why that is the case. But every single other part of your body is fed oxygen through blood. In other words, blood is connecting God to man. Symbolically, blood is the connection between God and man. So think about God being here, supplying his power, and that's symbolic of oxygen, into Adam that's lying on the floor, which is flesh. And the bit that gets the oxygen, it gets God's power into Adam and alive, is the blood itself. It's the blood that is the connection between the two. Do you see what I'm saying here? In other words, if there was no blood, there would be no connection between man and God. God could not get his oxygen, his life into us. The blood is the connection. So that is why, I mean it's incredible really, that it says it like this in the Bible, that the life is in the blood. In the old days, in this country, if somebody was very ill, they would cut them to bleed off blood, thinking that the blood was bad and it would make a bit of difference to literally lose pints and pints and pints of blood. The life is in the blood. It was a very bad idea. Let me tell you some amazing stuff about blood. 
Blood flows everywhere through the human body. We cannot live without it. The heart pumps blood to all of our body cells, every single last one of them, apart from the cornea in your eye. It supplies it with oxygen and food. Blood carries proteins and all these other things. It is basically going around your body the whole time, keeping you alive and critically supplying oxygen. You breathe in about 17,000 times per day. It's a process you rarely think about, but behind the scenes, a huge coordinated effort is playing out. Your vital organs, the gut, brain, bones, lungs, blood, and heart, work together to sustain your life by delivering oxygen to tissues throughout your body. Most of our cells need oxygen because it's one of the key ingredients of aerobic respiration. That's the process that produces a molecule called ATP, which our cells use to power their many incredible functions. But getting oxygen throughout our bodies is a surprisingly difficult task. Gas enters cells by diffusing in from their surroundings, and that only happens efficiently over tiny distances. So, for oxygen to reach the cells within our bodies, it needs a transportation network. This is where our 20 trillion red blood cells come in. Each one contains about 270 million oxygen-binding molecules of hemoglobin, which is what gives blood its scarlet hue. 20 trillion blood cells going through your body delivering oxygen, right? What I found amazing was there are 60,000 miles of blood vessels in a human body. And in one day, blood travels nearly 12,000 miles through the body. It's doing that all the time because it's delivering oxygen. Now here is the link, look. Blood is the symbolic link between God and man. It delivers the breath of God, oxygen, now, to our flesh. Is that true? Can we prove that now? Well, we can now. The science is there. When we sin, the link is broken, isn't it? We're now saying, when we sin, that here I am as a man sinning, and now I am broken. I'm away from God, because God is here, and I'm sinning here, and God can have nothing to do with it. Therefore, the bit that links us together, our relationship is broken. To show that the link is broken is why blood is shed. Because it's saying that that's the bit that links flesh and God together. Because we've sinned, blood has to be shed. Because as when blood is shed, we're saying that the link between us is broken. Do you see what I'm saying? That is why there is no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. It is a symbolic act to show that the link between us is broken because of our sin. And that is all it is. It's a symbolic thing that is, that, that is happening. Here's me with flesh. There's God. He's providing his power to me through oxygen. And by shedding blood, it's saying... Actually, and of course, what happens when we shed blood? We die because God is no longer able to keep us alive because he requires us to have the blood in our body. So look, the bottom line is, the Old Testament sacrifices were nothing more or less than what I've just said to you. They were important reminders of their own sin, and they were the ones that should be dying. And when the blood was shed, it was basically saying the link between me and God is broken, and that was it. Happy so far? And life continued like that for some time. Well, for that, how long did it continue like that? How many years? It continued like that for 4,000 years. From the time of creation up to the time of Christ. Now there's something quite interesting here. Because in the Bible there is a contradiction which we need to just cover off. In Leviticus 4 verse 20 it says... He shall do with the bull as he did with the bull as a sin offering. Thus he, sh he shall do with it. So the priest shall make atone atonement for them and it shall be forgiven them. So this sounds like when they sacrificed the bull, this was forgiving their sins, doesn't it? But then, 
In Hebrews 10 verse 4 it says, It is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. Hold on a minute. That says that they've forgiven their sins by the sacrifice of a bull. This says it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Now that's interesting, isn't it? And that's what I'm going to quickly answer. Because do you know something? The blood of bulls and goats did not remove their sin. I'll show you what it did in just a second. Because, by the way, if the blood of bulls and goats did remove sin, would there have been any need for Jesus to have died, do you think? No. Huh. Here's a bit of a chalkboard, okay? So human sin should equal a human death, shouldn't it? Because God said to Adam, not that another creature's going to die, he said, you will die. So we know that ultimately human sin has to lead to human death. And therefore, human sin leading to animal death actually just doesn't work. It's a reminder, of course it is, but it doesn't actually solve the equation. That animal has nothing to do with me. It's just a reminder of where I actually am. And that's all it is. Your sin does not actually and cannot actually equal an animal's death. It's just a reminder that it should be us. The animal has no understanding. What animal understands God? No animal can understand God. Here is exactly the situation. I'm going to put it in a graphic that shows you what happened to sin in Old Testament times. I love this graphic. Right, here we go. That's exactly what it was doing. Because the word atonement means covering. And you know, we say now we sweep things under the carpet, don't we? We sweep it under the carpet. Effectively, that's what was happening with sin. It was just sweeping things under the... Was the sin still there? Yes. Yes. But did God say, well, I'm, I'll overlook it. It's, it's sort of covered by what you're doing with these sacrifices. But it's still there. It couldn't totally be removed because it was an animal's death, not a human death. There wasn't the right connection. So God was let, allowing it to be swept under the carpet. But was there total salvation available? No, because the sin is still there. And so all these people would have died, 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 died and would have stayed dead. So even though God had sort of couldn't, you know, sort of hidden it away, it was still there. So he could not have raised any of them to immortal life, because I'm sorry, your sin is still there. It's sort of only covered up. I haven't totally removed it, because the animal only reminded you of the situation. We know ultimately that the sacrifice that God wants, here it is in Psalm 51, you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You don't delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and a contrite heart. God didn't really even care for these sacrifices. It was what it, what it made you think and what it did in your heart that was the most important. Do you think? The, the, the Pharisees, it was all about, I'm just going to kill certain things as a sacrifice and cared nothing for God. Did not have a humble and contrite heart, did they? So the solution that God came up with, and of course he came up with it at the beginning, he knew this would be the final solution, was to provide effectively a human being that had no sin as a perfect human sacrifice. So if he could get a human with no sin, and that person died, he has then got a perfect human sacrifice. And of course we know the only person who's done that is Jesus who had no sin, and yet he still died and shed blood. So God then was able to give us that sacrifice, wasn't he? If he wanted, he didn't have to, but he could now give us a perfect human sacrifice. Instead of an animal that was with no connection to us, he could give us a human one. So originally, my formula was Andy Walton's sin equals Andy Walton's death. And through the mercy of God, what it now says is that my sin equals Jesus Christ's death. God didn't have to give me that, by the way. By his grace, he gave me this. And because he gives me the death of Jesus into my own personal formula, my sin is therefore removed. How amazing is that? 
we don't have to keep doing animal sacrifices. Now the question is, how do I get Jesus Christ's death into my own formula? There's only one, well there's two things you have to do. Believe and be baptised. Belief and baptism, we're told, are the two things you must do to get Jesus' sacrifice into your own formula. It says in Mark 16, verse 16, what? Believe and be baptised and you will be saved. That's it. Because baptism is like clothing ourselves in Jesus. It's all still symbolic, isn't it? We're still in the world of symbolism. That's all it is, is symbolic. In Romans 6 verse 3, just have a quick look at this. Have I got two minutes? Yeah. Nearly finished. In Romans 6 verse 3, says something very interesting. This is in relation to baptism, of course. It says, Know ye not... That so many of us as were baptised into Jesus Christ were baptised into his death. death, not life, death. Because it was the death of Jesus that was the critical bit. Because when he had died, he had won because he had not sinned at that point and he had given himself as a sacrifice. So we're baptised into his death. So God has given, do you remember on this previous screen, he said Andy Walton sinned used to equal Andy Walton's death, it's now Andy Walton's sin now equals Jesus Christ's death. The formula is balanced. It can only be balanced if we get Jesus' death into our own formula. And because he was perfect, of course, that's why our sins are forgiven. The other quick one to look at, which we look at so many times, it's a wonderful verse in Galatians 3. Galatians 3, verse 27. For as many of you as have been baptised into Christ have put on Christ. So God says, when you're baptised, it's all symbolic, I don't have to do it, but I'm telling you this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to pretend to wrap Jesus all around you. So I now see Jesus before I see Mark Silber, right? Mark is baptised, so Jesus is wrapped around him, he's clothed in Christ. That's why we become adopted sons and daughters at the point when we're baptised, yeah? What happens after, and of course our sins are washed away at this point, because we are now associated with the sacrifice of a human being that won, not an animal that had done nothing. An animal has won nothing. Had they? Well, if an animal dies, has it won anything? Hasn't won anything, he hasn't overcome anything. Jesus has overcome. So our sins are washed away. What, by the way, happens after baptism in terms of our sin? Do we continue to sin? Yes. We jolly well do. And I like this picture coming up now. <coughs> right. The good that I want to do is that way. The evil that I don't want to do is that. And at the last minute, how many times do we swerve off onto that one do you think yeah I mean that's life isn't it I mean we and we go why are particularly when the police are beyond you (laughs) (laughs) but do you think that happens oh yes I'm afraid it does ah so now we have a problem we've accepted Jesus we've been baptised and yet I still mess up do you think it would be a good idea I don't know whether you think this is a good idea, that we should keep remembering what price was paid for us, just like they did with animals on a regular basis. Do you think it would be a good idea to keep remembering and reminding ourselves of the price that's been paid, just as they did with animals? How do you think, what would be a good idea to do that? Break bread and wine on a Sunday. To break bread and wine on a Sunday. This is our equivalent of every week turning up at the tabernacle and sacrificing animals because of our sin. It's no different, it's just that we don't have to cut animals' throats and burn them anymore because all that was doing was reminding them of their sin and that they were only being covered. Now 
We just remember the one sacrifice that did it properly. And it says in Hebrews 10 verse 10, we have been made holy. That's amazing, isn't it? Holy means separate to God through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. We don't have to keep, we don't come along with an animal anymore. But can you see why now it is so critical for us to be here on a Sunday to do this? Jesus has done all the hard work. He's done all the heavy lifting. I'm telling you now, whatever we've gone through, it cannot be close to what Jesus went through. Because if he failed once, he was out of a job. Just once. We're not hammered. However bad we go through life, we are not hammered onto a stake and dropped in for hours hanging there. Are we? With the weight of the world and the weight of our whole world... And God's whole plan and purpose on our shoulders. This is stress like we cannot imagine. And that's all God has said. I don't even say, he doesn't even say, listen, come along with an animal and sacrifice. He said, don't do that anymore. I just ask you to come along and remember as often as you can, once a week, seems fair, to remember the price that's been paid. And the next time we say to ourselves, I'm going to have a line, I'm not going to come, I'm going to do something else. Think to yourself. That is what was done for me. And all he's asking me to do is turn up and think and take a little piece of bread and a nice sip of wine. It's not like eat something terrible. (laughs) Is it? It's not like drink real blood. Oh my goodness. He said, have some nice wine and a bit of bread and think about me. The last slide is this. Before Jesus came along, This sacrifice that was going on was a reminder of their sin and the price that should be paid. Yeah? After Christ, it's a reminder of our sin and the price that has been paid. You see the difference? This was a reminder of their sin and the price that should be paid. This is a reminder of our sin and the price that has been paid. Sacrifice was accomplished by Christ, wasn't it? And accepted by us if we want to. And allowed by God. It's accomplished by Christ, it's accepted by us. And by God's grace, it's allowed by him.